Welcome. What a wonderful turnout. Uh, I'm Liz McGill. I'm the dean of the law school. I just want to introduce uh, the event, but I know why you're all here, uh, which is to uh, hear the, the keynote speaker. But this is the inaugural event of the Stanford Human Rights Center. We have a great speaker, Jim Cavallero, who's the director of the center, is going to give a proper introduction to Ken Roth, but I know you all know he's the uh, executive director of Human Rights Watch, a wonderful organization. And Jim, I think, is also going to tell you a little bit more about the kickoff series of the Human Rights Center, which is entitled The Future of Human Rights. I just want to say this is a fabulous time for Stanford Law School. I'm, I'm a newcomer here, and it's a great time to come. Everyone who looks at legal practice knows that law schools need to become more global. Law is, in some ways, the most parochial of disciplines. It's jurisdictional. Uh, the world out there is changing and ignoring those traditional jurisdictional boundaries in many ways. And we have been working very hard to be a leader in an effort to make law, legal education, and law schools more global, and particularly in the area of human rights. You probably all know Jenny Martinez was just here. Uh, there's Jenny. Jenny Martinez and Alan Weiner of our faculty have been teaching human rights. Jenny wrote a wonderful book in 2012 on the origin of human rights. Uh, but we're doing a couple of things quite recently that I want to talk to you a little bit about. We've taken some significant steps. So last academic year, we launched the International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. Over the past quarters that it's existed, it's done an extraordinary amount of work. It's undertaken dozens of projects and in as many countries as the projects. I'm going to talk about two examples you may know about if you're following what the clinic has been doing. One is the Living Under Drones report uh, that that clinic issued. They researched and drafted the report uh, on drone practices and their consequences for civilians living in Pakistan. It has really affected the terms of the debate over drones or unmanned aerial vehicles uh, and the future of warfare and counterterrorism. It's been highlighted in, I think, every national uh, publication and has gotten a lot of attention. That's one of the efforts of the clinic. They also, the clinic also recently released a report calling for an overhaul of the International Labor Organization's monitoring and reporting mechanisms uh, in Cambodian textile factories. The report uh, also attracted substantial media attention and a lot of coverage in Cambodia itself uh, and publications focused on the textile industry. And it's now being used by a variety of stakeholders and parties interested in working conditions in textile factories to affect change in those countries. So. Uh, Jim tells me that if you are, any of you are wearing uh, Gap t-shirts, uh, Levi jeans, or a Stanford logo apparel, and I, I see some of you probably are, uh, that report uh, is aimed at changing some of the practices in the companies, in the, in the factories where those were made. This kind of work is, I think, uniquely possible at Stanford because of the way we have designed our clinical program. So our clinical program is full-time. Students who enroll in the clinic, that is their, that is their job for the quarter. Uh, for International Human Rights Clinic, this means that they can travel to other countries. The students and the instructors can travel to other countries and do this research and work on uh, the work that they are doing in a very uh, full-time more than full-time, really, uh, way. And I think that is a, a, a form of engaged learning that is uniquely available at Stanford. Our, our students, I know, traveled to Pakistan with the supervisors twice to work on the drones report and four times to Cambodia to work on the most recent report that I referenced. They've also traveled to Washington and many other places to do work uh, to explain what these reports have said and advocate for change based on these reports. So we are not, that's a recent thing we did last year. This year we are launching the Human Rights Center. Uh, it's, I think, adding a vital dimension to the international program here. Uh, I know the center is going to provide a great space for the study and the analysis of human rights law and human rights practice. It's going to engage students, faculty, visitors uh, in the essential issues in that field. I'm very pleased that Jim Cavallaro, who directs the clinic, is also going to direct the center. Those of you who are here, I'm sure, know Jim. Uh, he's a leading practitioner and scholar on human rights issues. He has decades of experience in this field. He's worked in two dozen countries uh, across the globe on a broad range of uh, different human rights issues. He's written extensively about these issues uh, and is a respected analyst on them. And he's done this terrific job with the clinic in this, in this one year that he's been here. 
So I'm going to ask Jim actually to introduce Ken, uh, but let me say in closing for myself that I'm just delighted to see uh, the interest uh, in this center and this series that we're launching uh, and in what Ken has to tell us today. And I need to make one small apology, uh, which is that I have to go off to another event, which uh, is much to my regret. I would like to be here, but I'm going to watch it on podcast. So thank you for coming. So thank you all. Uh, I've uh, been introduced by my current boss, and now I will introduce my former boss. Uh, so I'm right in between the two. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to present Ken, but I did want to start by telling you a few things about the, the new Stanford Human Rights Center, things that are of interest uh, to the community here. Uh, and also I'd like to, again, welcome all of you. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I should recognize as well that I see the uh, President Toledo, uh, former president of Peru, with us today. Uh, we have many other uh, important uh, individuals with us, but I can't help to recognize that. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Let me tell you a bit about the Human Rights Center and what we plan to do and how I hope uh, you collectively can be engaged in this enterprise. Uh, uh, first, our initial series of events or talks on the future of human rights. We wanted to start with a topic uh, that is broad, uh, but one that can be observed and analyzed from very, many different perspectives, and we're bringing in very top-level practitioners and analysts and scholars uh, from this country and from around the world. And we're starting, of course, with Ken Roth, and I'll tell you about, about him uh, in just a minute. Uh, I want to tell you about the, the coming events this spring, so you're aware of them. Uh, most of them are listed on the poster, so if you look at the poster, you'll see them. But there's one addition, which is an event uh, which should occur on April 15th. We're finalizing it. It might be the 16th. Uh, as soon as we know, we'll let you know by email and on Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, Sam Gregory of Witness uh, will be speaking on technology and human rights. On April 22nd, our very own Jenny Martinez uh, Professor Jenny Martinez will consider the question, does the history of human rights matter for the future? Then on April 29th, uh, leading ATS litigator Paul Hoffman will speak on human rights litigation in U.S. courts after Kiobel. In May, we'll begin with Professor Balakrishnan Rajagopal of MIT, who will assess the rise of the South. And the last event that we have planned now uh, for this quarter on May 13th, Ejim Dike, the director of the U.S. Human Rights Network, will speak about the future of human rights in the United States. Uh, at all of these events, we will have an engaged discussion, question and answer, and free lunch. Uh, I hope we can entice you to come as to as many as possible. I should also note that the series will continue in the fall, uh, so it will run through the year 2013, and we already have confirmations from Professor Mahmoud Mamdani of Columbia, and Makarere University, and Makal Mutua uh, from Buffalo. Before I get to Ken, one more note, a bit of uh, PR. The Human Rights Center will also be funding two fellowships per year for Stanford law graduates, fully funded to work in human rights. Uh, information about these two fellowship opportunities will be available on our website. So something to think about post-graduation, those of you who are uh, studying with us at Stanford Law School. Now today's speaker, uh, so we can stay on time. Ken Roth, uh, in fact, requires no introduction to anyone remotely familiar with the topic of human rights. He's the executive director of Human Rights Watch, an institution that he has led to its singular position of prominence and influence in the field of human rights globally. Uh, Ken has done this with a combination of intellect, judgment, savvy, and the capacity to identify and hire the best talent. Uh, that judgment is in no way affected by the fact that he was in part responsible uh, for hiring me at Human Rights Watch. Uh, much better evidence of that acuity and that ability to hire the best is the fact that this year Omar Shakar, who's here, has been selected as a Finberg Fellow, uh, and that Peter Buchart, also of Stanford Law School, is the Director of Emergencies at uh, Human Rights Watch. On a more serious note, uh, Ken oversees a behemoth of an organization with offices around the world, researchers working on issues in some 100 countries, regional and thematic divisions. 
Human Rights Watch is an organization that produces more quality information on human rights, more reliable information on human rights issues than any other organization in the world, full stop. Uh, at the same time, Ken is a prolific writer, I'm not sure where he finds the time, uh, whose analysis of human rights issues has appeared in major journals, continues to appear in major journals uh, of policy, academic, and other publications. I think uh, Ken's son enjoyed that comment about him. He is quite a, a writer, you're absolutely right. So <laughs> uh, and most importantly for us, Ken is someone who is more than capable as you will see, of taking a critical look at the field of human rights and at where it's headed. So with that, uh, Ken will be joining us today. We'll speak on the future of human rights, pressuring rights abusers as power shifts and diffuses. Please, let's give a warm welcome to our speaker, our first speaker, Ken Roth. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, as Jim alluded, I've been following Jim Cavallaro around for a long time, um, and it's, it's a pleasure to follow him here to, to Stanford as well and to be back. Um, I'm also you know, quite honored to be able to launch this inaugural series of lectures for the Human Rights Center. Um, I, I think the idea of the center is, is very much needed because, you know, frankly, there is too little conversation between the academy and human rights activists. And, and I can think of no one better to try to bring the two together more consistently than Jim, who obviously has a, you know, a long history of, of doing top-notch research and advocacy, but also you know, between Harvard and now here at Stanford, has lived in, in the academy and sort of understands what it takes to, to do well there. And I'm very hopeful that this center will be a forum for you know, more productive and more regular conversations uh, between the academy and, and those of us who are involved day to day in the activism and don't really have time to, um, to do the in-depth studies that are possible here. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge a few people. Um, a number of members of the, the Human Rights Watch Board, um, the Human Rights Watch uh, California Committee North, um, as well as our, our, our staff director um, are all here. And so I want to thank you for, for taking the time to join us. I also want to acknowledge my son, you know, a, a Stanford Law um, student for the future, although he's, you know, you know, he's, <laughs> yes, you know, he, he's heard it all already, though, so he's like, you know, too busy watching Beauty and the Beast, and we'll, <laughs> we can test him on that later. And of course, my wife, Annie. Um, was, um, anyway, I, I um, have been asked to, um, to talk about sort of where the human rights movement is going. And I, I thought I would focus on two things that are changing quite radically at the moment. Um, one having to do with where power is centered in the world, you know, who are the influential governments, um, and the other on, on changes in communications um, and how, you know, the, the new things that are possible with um, the new communication technology. Um, the reason I focus on those two things is because, you know, frankly, those are both essential to how the human rights movement gets things done. Um, I think you're all familiar with, you know, the investigations that we do, the reports that we publish, but you know, we're not just a publishing company. We, we put out this information for the purpose of generating pressure on governments to change. And we generate that pressure really in two ways. You know, first, by, by shaming governments through the media. And second, by enlisting influential governments or institutions on our behalf to put pressure on the target government to change. Um, you know, that is, in, in simple form, what the what Human Rights Watch does, and what the various human rights organizations like us do. And each of those is changing very radically these days. And we have had to accommodate those shifts. So I thought I would just sort of outline some of those changes and then hopefully open it up for discussion because I want to kind of minimize the lecture part of this. Um, first, I mean, it, to, to understand where we're going, it's useful to understand where we have been. Uh, when Human Rights Watch was launched, we would you know, conduct investigations in a handful of countries at that stage. And we would deploy the information in Washington. And we would ask the US government to do what it could on behalf of, of our, our concerns. You know, obviously, that's a very one-dimensional approach. It plays right into the idea of the human rights movement being kind of US dominated. Um, and of course, the US wasn't the only powerful government around. So for the last 15 years or so, Human Rights Watch has very deliberately been expanding our capacity to deploy information in Europe as well. 
and we have a series of offices in the obvious capitals in Europe, um, you know, in Brussels, London, Paris, Berlin. Um, we have an office in Geneva focusing on the United Nations, along with one in New York that does the same thing. Um, but again, you know, as, as you gather from, by listening to this list, it was still a very Western orientation. And so, you know, I don't need to tell you that power is shifting these days. Um, you know, it's partly that economic power is shifting away from the West, but also to some extent moral authority. Um, you know, the West never was pure, but, but certainly it had a hard time, you know, surviving the George Bush counterterrorism era. Um, Europe itself has, you know, is responsible for various abuses from the mistreatment of Roma to the, the mistreatment of migrants and, and various um, religious or eth ethnic minorities. And so while, you know, the Western governments are still very powerful, you know, very important allies, we no longer could consider them the sole source of influence. And indeed, if you, you know, if you looked around the world, some of the problem countries that we were focusing on um, were becoming growingly indifferent to Western pressure. And if you think about the world from the perspective of Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, he'd lost the United States, he'd lost Europe. You know, what he cared about was South Africa and the so-called Sadiq countries around him. Or, or, you know, Sri Lanka, another country we've been spending a lot of time on, is already, you know, is under pressure from the various Western governments, but is looking to hang on by enlisting the likes of Japan and, and China and India, you know, the dominant powers in its region. And so, you know, it wasn't rocket science for us to figure out that we needed to be able to um, enlist these emerging powers, these emerging non-Western powers, and get them to promote human rights in their foreign policies the way we have traditionally looked to Western governments. Um, now, the tools for doing that are really no different from the tools that we've used in Western capitals. We, we set up an office. We you know, staff it basically with a, a local human rights leader, you know, a South African in South Africa, a Brazilian in Brazil. Uh, we then begin to build contacts with local government officials, because you know, in any government, there's always, you know, there's some allies, there's some adversaries, and you try to identify who's who and, and build alliances within the government. We try to build alliances with local NGOs um, and typically try to get domestic human rights groups to begin to look also at their country's foreign policy. Um, and then we try to get the press to write about these issues, because the press um, in many of these countries doesn't look at foreign policy. It only looks at things that are happening in the country. Um, and, and foreign policy, the more it's able to exist in a vacuum, in the shadows, the less likely it is to reflect human rights concerns. Because what is common in the various countries where Human Rights Watch has opened up, and we've done this now in, in Brazil, South Africa, India, um, Japan, where we're planning to go forward in Turkey, um, all of these places are democracies at home. And all of them have foreign policies that look more like dictatorships. And the reason for that, I mean, there, there are various reasons. You know, part of it is, um, you know, some countries like, you know, say India with its, its record in Kashmir, um, or, or, you know, Japan with its war record, or Brazil with its record as a, um, as a you know, a military dictatorship. Um, they all have, you know, peccadillos in their past and sometimes their present that they don't really want people focusing on. And they're afraid that if they start talking about human rights too much, there will be a boomerang effect and it'll come back to haunt them. Um, you know, second, there is you know, a view that human rights is a kind of a colonial or an, an imperialist enterprise. That this is just another way for the West to impose itself on, on governments outside the West. Um, or that you know, this is another way in which the Cold War is still being fought in human rights terms. You, know, you hear various excuses like this, but what you know, all the foreign ministries that these governments have in common is that for one of these reasons or another, they don't promote human rights. And what we have gambled on is that this discrepancy between the domestic values of these countries and their foreign policies is one that we can work with, that by shining a spotlight on the foreign policy and by making the people of the country aware that you know, the dinosaurs in the foreign ministry 
are not doing what you would expect a democratic government to do. They're not promoting democratic values anyplace else. That that discrepancy will be embarrassing. And that gradually, by building a domestic constituency that pays attention to what the foreign ministry is doing, we can change what the foreign ministry does. Um, and under that theory, we have been opening up a series of offices in, in, in these key non-Western capitals. Um, let me give you a little bit of a sense of how it's going. And I want to just you know, give a few illustrations where this effort has made a difference. Um, one happened just um, a couple of weeks ago. I, I was just in, in Japan last week. And among other things, I met with the new prime minister, Shinzo Abe. And we met with him actually to thank him among other things. I mean, we gave him new things to do. You know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't do that. But we, we thanked him because he had just launched the first global human rights campaign that Japan had ever undertaken. Um, and he did this because Kanai Doi, the, the Japanese woman who heads our Tokyo office, had convinced him to push for what's known as a commission of inquiry, sort of a, a semi-criminal investigation, into crimes against humanity being committed by the North Korean government. And you know, even though um, Japan is very concerned about what happens in North Korea, it's concerned by an incredibly kind of narrow perspective of the handful of Japanese who were abducted from Japanese soil, basically kidnapped, you know, brought to North Korea, and disappeared for the purpose of teaching North Korean spies how to speak fluent Japanese. And their lives were ruined. They just disappeared, and they're there. Um, and so this issue of the abductees is a big issue in Japan. And we were able to convince, or Kanai was able to convince Shinzo Abe, that he would never make any progress on the abductees without addressing the human rights of all North Koreans. That the fate of the abductees was very much tied to the fate of North Koreans as a whole. Um, he bought it. And not only did he buy it for the purpose of Japan's own posture, he, for the first time ever, deployed Japanese diplomats around the world to press for this to happen. And it was not um, an, an atmosphere that was very conducive to victory. Because you know, when we first brought up this idea of a commission of inquiry in various European capitals, they were saying, oh, we don't know. It's so expensive. What good is it going to do? You know, and they were completely on the fence. Um, it was because the Japanese diplomats went knocking on the door. And as kind of the most interested government in North Korea, other than perhaps South Korea, um, Japan was able, you know, was listened to. And these governments said, well, OK, if Japan is pushing this, we'll go with it. And so at the UN Human Rights Council just a week ago, we got a unanimous resolution creating a commission of inquiry for North Korea, which would not have happened if we were sticking with our Western advocacy, if we had not enlisted you know, an, an important non-Western government in this effort. Um, let me give you another example coming out of the UN Human Rights Council. Um, a couple of years ago, we wanted to press for the first ever resolution on LGBT rights, focusing in particular on, on violence and discrimination against LGBT people. And you know, the, the concern was if this were simply led by the usual Western suspects, it would get no place. Um, you know, various governments around the world would say, oh, this is here it goes. The West is imposing its morality on us. You know, we're not going to go with this. So we, had, we wanted to convince a significant southern government to do this. And um, we went to the South African government as um, one that has you know, a very enlightened constitution, um, a constitutional court that has interpreted that constitution very progressively. And um, it was willing to run with it. And so the South African-led effort to achieve an LGBT rights resolution prevailed, um, which just would not have happened had it, had it been a Western effort. Um, these kinds of efforts outside of the West have actually transformed the UN Human Rights Council from being, you know, initially kind of a replication of the earlier Human Rights Commission, which is to say, you know, a club of dictators protecting themselves, um, into a viable mechanism for promoting human rights. And today it is dominated by democracies that, um, despite the temptation to vote regional solidarity, despite pressure to view human rights as you know, an imperialist venture, are regularly taking pro-human rights positions. And we're achieving majority after majority um, in a way that was not possible even three or four years ago. So you know, this all is due, I think, very much to 
I mean, I've just given you a couple of examples, but a, a very active outreach to a range of non-Western democracies, including through NGOs. We've actually created a, a coalition of NGOs that we call HRC Net. And these are national NGOs that have an interest in foreign policy. We provide them the information to know what's going on in Geneva. Um, we, we, there are travel funds available so they can send representatives to lobby. And most important though, they go back home and they talk to the press and they talk to the government and they, they create noise in their countries so that you know, what happens in Geneva is no longer some obscure little thing that a handful of diplomats know about, but it's rather something that you know, everybody knows about. And in those circumstances, these governments are much more likely to vote properly. So you know, that it gives you some examples of how this plays out. Now, so far I've been talking about the UN Human Rights Council. And in many ways, that's the easier situation because the Human Rights Council is non-coercive. You know, all it can do is condemn or investigate or, or report. Um, it, it cannot use military force. It cannot invoke the International Criminal Court. It cannot impose an arms embargo. All those sorts of coercive things have to be done by the UN Security Council. And there it's been um, you know, a bit more of an uphill battle. We, um, I suppose the high point in many ways was at the, um, with the Libya resolution of a couple of years ago, where um, for sort of idiosyncratic reasons, a number of the key southern governments came along. Um, this was the point where um, the so-called IBSA governments, um, India, Brazil, and South Africa, all happened to be sitting on the Security Council at the same time. You know, all had non-permanent two-year seats on the Security Council. And these were you know, three of the, the leading southern governments that are often mentioned as part of this global shift. Um, they were you know, unsure about what to do with respect to Libya at a time when you know, Gaddafi was threatening to engage in mass slaughter in Benghazi. And um, I say for idiosyncratic reasons they came along, um, the key development there was actually that the Libyan mission in New York defected. Um, they had been, you know, Qaddafi's representatives, um, but they wanted nothing to do with Qaddafi's slaughter, so they all defected. We were able to go to that mission, whatever its status was once they defected, and convince it to ask for um, Security Council help, which they did. They wrote a letter. And you know, even though this was you know, a complete fiction, everybody knew that they didn't represent the Libyan government anymore, it was enough of a fig leaf to convince initially South Africa to go along. They said, well, if Libya is for this, you know, we're obviously going to favor it. And South Africa being the key because it was the other African government. And for these purposes, Libya is considered part of Africa. Um, so South Africa went along. And then at that point, Brazil and India said, well, you know, if, 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 if the major you know, African democracy is with you on this. We'll join you as well. And, and before you knew it, um, the only country left standing was China. And they, um, this was like, a, yeah, I think, you know, a Saturday afternoon, and they, they said, we want to, um, you know, we want an adjournment so we can consult back with Beijing. And so they got on the phone, and they woke everybody up. And, you know, three hours later, they came back all smiles, and China and Russia had joined what was then a, you know, no dissent, no, no veto, a resolution authorizing, in that case, military force to, um, to, to stop Gaddafi from killing the people of Benghazi. So you know, that was in many ways um, you know, the high point. However you feel about it, this was the sort of the strongest position that these southern democracies had taken um, in defense of human rights. Now, in many respects, um, Syria today is paying a price for that victory. Because I think, as many of you know, there was a, um, a sense that NATO then overstepped its authorization. That what the Security Council authorized was the protection of civilians, and NATO went on and did regime change. Now, you know, NATO could, although it hasn't, defended itself by saying, oh, the only way we could protect civilians was by getting rid of Gaddafi, because otherwise he was going to continue to kill one way or the other. NATO just hasn't entered this debate. But there has been a reaction to it. Um, you know, one reaction came from Brazil, which put forward this concept of responsibility while protecting. Um, you probably all know about responsibility to protect, or R2P for short, which is um, you know, a resolution adopted a number of years ago at a, at a world summit of global leaders saying that if a country 
can't protect its own citizens, the world has a responsibility to protect them. And it was under that R2P doctrine that the Security Council acted with respect to Libya. Um, unhappy with how that happened, Brazil put forward this concept of responsibility while protecting. You, know, you have to monitor the protectors while they're in there protecting. Um, not a bad concept. And we actually you know, talked to them and said, we, we you know, agree with you. We have something to discuss here. At which point, they stopped talking. Because um, you know, <laughs> I, I think that's what you know, Brazil Foreign Minister Petriot is not really what he had in mind. I think he had in mind somehow undermining R2P rather than enhancing R2P. Um, but but in, it, it sort of showed this sort of shift um, in orientation that began with, with the Libya humanitarian intervention. Um, in Syria, the same leading southern global democracies have been very slow. Um, they've ultimately come around to voting for various initiatives, whether it's an arms embargo or um, invoking the International Criminal Court um, or various sanctions against the Assad regime. But they've done it slowly and hesitantly, and as a result have made it easier for Russia and China to veto. Um, you know, one thing that we've noticed over the years is that Russia and China don't like to stand alone. Um, they like to have the cover of what they see as their closest peers. You know, they're, they're perfectly content to be going head to head with the Western governments. That's, you know, that was the Cold War, that's just continuing in another form. But they don't like to be outside the leading governments of the Global South. Um, the fact that these Southern democracies have been so slow in coming out for um, some kind of solution in Syria has made it easier for Russia in particular, which is really playing the lead here, to continue to block any serious answer. You saw this most recently just last week at the so-called BRICS summit that took place in Johannesburg, where um, if you look at the final communique, the, the language that is in there about Syria was the exact same language that they used a year ago when 9,000 civilians had been killed. You know, now 70,000 plus civilians have been killed, and it's the same anodyne nothingness that they put into this communique. Um, you know, the one positive element that they had in there was they said it's important that humanitarian aid be provided. And, you know, our ears perked up, you know, when we, when we heard that. Um, but it remains to be seen whether that is going to transform into Russian conduct at the Security Council because so far Russia has blocked any Security Council effort to authorize so-called cross-border assistance, you know, assistance from Turkey into northern Syria where there is desperate need at this stage, um, particularly in Aleppo where, you know, there's just an account that came out today that 2.4 million out of the 2.5 million residents of Aleppo are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance. They're not getting it from Damascus because Syria is blocking that. So the only route would be from Turkey, but they can't, UN rules don't permit cross-border um, aid unless authorized by either the government, which is not going to happen, or by the Security Council, which Russia is blocking. So, you know, th this, this reluctance to really sort of step forward in a vigorous role in the Security Council is, um, you know, is making life difficult for us. It, it shows that this is still very much a work in progress. Um, let me um, shift for a moment, because I don't want to take too long here, to talk about um, communications. And to put this in perspective, I think it's useful to describe how um, the human rights movement began and how it was in its early days. Um, if you think about you know, what was the first human rights campaign that ever took place, you could argue, you know, was it the anti-slavery effort? Was it the, the woman's suffrage effort? You know, something like that. And what those had in common is that they were big, long-lasting problems. They didn't change day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, they existed pretty much you know, permanently at that stage, which meant that you could rally attention and concern and outrage over them. Um, at at an, an age where information traveled by steamship, you couldn't mobilize people around a political prisoner or around the latest act of repression or you know, the police shooting at rioters. Uh, you know, you wouldn't even hear about it until it was long past. So, you know, the human rights movement was really limited by the capacity of communications technology, which was 
very restricted. Now, if you go to sort of the modern human rights movement, you know, we tend to date that to 1961, the creation of Amnesty International. Um, but early Amnesty, you know, they were doing a little bit better than steamships at that stage, but not a whole lot better. You know, your typical Amnesty researcher in the early days would sit there and write a letter. You know, dear senior so-and-so, is it true that your son was arrested? You know, could you please provide us with the details? Put it in the post. Wait. <laughs> you know? Weeks later, it would come back. And, and you say, oh my goodness, you know, yes. But I've got a few more questions here. And you'd write again, you know. <laughs> you know, and so it was, you know, it was slow. Um, you know, a typical investigation would, you know, involve sending people to a capital. They would interview people. They'd come back. They'd write up their report. Six months later, they'd put it out. And it would be news because no one had been following it. You know, it was all very novel. Uh, and, you know, this is the way it was. I, I remember when I started in the human rights movement, and I'm dating myself here, I'm sorry, but um, it was a big deal to smuggle a fax machine. Remember those? A fax machine <laughs> into, you know, a Soviet bloc country. Why? Well, because, you know, phone calls were really expensive. And so you couldn't, you know, interview people by phone without running up a, an astronomical budget. So you had to, you know, the fax machine allowed you to convey lots of information on a quick phone call. It's a major innovation. It was worth smuggling the machine in for that. You know, but that's where we were really, you know, until the age of the internet. And the internet, you know, suddenly made it possible to communicate quickly. So you could get information in, you know, pretty close to real time. You could start reacting to events as they were happening. Um, you could mobilize people cheaply. You know, the first internet campaign that we ran was around landmines. And we ended up sharing in the Nobel Peace Prize for this because we were able to build a coalition of NGOs initially and ultimately governments around the idea that these landmines were indiscriminate weapons. Um, it wouldn't have been possible if we were doing this by post or phone call, but by internet it was easy. Um, and that has you know, begun to very much change um, what we could do. Today, Human Rights Watch aspires to do real-time reporting in any situation in which lives are at stake. And so, you know, we will have, you know, people in the middle of a war zone. They will investigate a particular set of atrocities during the day. They'll write up their results quickly and email them to headquarters so they can be reviewed and rewritten and published. Um, we'll release them that night. Um, they'll be in the press the next day. And you often can see the change in conduct of the forces that suddenly recognize that they're being scrutinized the next day. You know, that's, that's how you save lives in real time. And that's, um, that aspiration is possible today because of the instantaneous nature of internet communication. Um, the one big consequence of the internet is that it's extraordinarily difficult for people to hide things. You know, if you think about, you know, some of the worst atrocities that we have known, you know, whether it's the, the, the Holocaust or, or the atrocities of the Khmer Rouge or, or even, you know, Saddam Hussein's genocide against the Kurds, the Anfal genocide, um, these were all things that at the time desperate efforts were made to keep hidden. And they were never entirely hidden. I mean, you know, Khmer Rouge killings were taking place in the countryside, you know, with people all around, you know, People witnessed the trains going to the gas chambers under the Nazis. Um, there were always people who knew, but they lacked the ability to communicate. And the internet has broken that. You know, now anybody can get online somehow. I mean, even if you have to travel a little bit. Um, so it's possible for any witness to not simply witness, but to witness and communicate. And, and that, I think, has meant that the spotlight of the human rights movement shines in pretty much any corner of the world. Um, that in and of itself is a remarkable shift from the early days of the movement. And it can do it in very close to real time. But the big, you know, the big new development, and I'll close on this, is the emergence of social media. Because um, social media you know, obviously means not only can we communicate you know, to an addressee, you know, somebody in our email list, it means we can communicate to the world. And pretty much anybody can be a publisher. Uh, it, you know, if you think about it, it you know, if you witness something and you put it on your Facemail account or you tweet it, 
um, if it's really important, it's going to spread. And that ability for you know, any of us to get word out very widely about an important issue is, is transformational. You know, you always had the possibility of sort of the, you know, the, the soapbox order who stood on the corner and shouted, you know, this government's doing terrible things. Um, but, you know, he, he or she could only be heard, you know, several dozens of yards away, um, but not further. You know, today, the, the social media equivalent of that means that you really do have the capacity to publish to the world. Um, social media obviously also has a tremendous organizational capacity. And if you think about you know, the role that it played, say, with the Trier Square uprising in Egypt, the, the effect really was that you know, before social media, before Facebook in that case, you had to be you know, a little crazy or a little suicidal or very, very dedicated to go demonstrate in Trier Square because you were very likely to be beaten up, arrested, tortured. You know, not pleasant things would happen to you. And what, what Facebook allowed was um, people to organize so that they were able to sort of, I mean, to stand up and be counted without literally standing up. They could um, sign up to this Facebook page, like the page for a particular demonstration, saying, you know, I'll be there. I'll be at that demonstration, you know, the one in, in two weeks. Uh, and as they, you know, as, as people looked around and more and more people signed up, that encouraged all others to sign up. And suddenly there was this, this sense of safety in numbers as, as tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people signed up for this demonstration. Nobody had stepped foot on Tahrir Square yet. But, it, but there was this tremendous organizing capacity. So by the time the date of the demonstration came, maybe only 10% of the people showed up. But that was a lot of people. And, and from that, a revolution was spawned. So that kind of you know, organizing capacity of social media is, is unprecedented. I mean, you could always have leaflets. You could have word of mouth. But there was nothing like this ability to sort of stand up and be seen standing up without literally risking much of anything other than a little like on your Facebook page. Um, now, the, the biggest change in my view that social media has brought us is um, the capacity of people to converse about what their government is doing. Now, you know, that sounds simple, but if you think about it, and if you're a dictator, you know, rule number one that you learn in dictator school is you do not let people talk to each other. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, you know, people can, you can think whatever you want. You know, when, 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 you, when you go home at the dinner table, all right, you can have a conversation there. We're not going to bother you there. But you cannot speak to broad numbers of people. Why? Because then everybody figures out that everyone else thinks the same way they do. You know, and they're all upset about what the dictator's doing. And once you get that, that safety in numbers, that's when revolutions start. You know, that's when, when people start demonstrating. So dictators know never to allow that kind of conversation, that broad public conversation to take place. Um, you know, that's why they break up NGOs. That's why they limit rallies. You know, anything that would manifest the fact that what you've got in your head, a lot of other people have in their head too, um, that's the top priority of a dictator. Social media has broken that. Because you know, once people start talking on social media, there's little the government can do to, to stop that conversation. And the best illustration of this today, the biggest illustration, is China, where there are 400 million users of social media. And so, you know, what happens on Weibo is beginning to force the Chinese government to respond. Um, you know, they, they are obviously responding, you know, as any classic authoritarian government would. They're trying to censor. But the, their traditional tools, the so-called Great Chinese Firewall, is worthless. Because the Chinese Firewall was designed to prevent Chinese people from exploring websites in the outside world, you know, getting to those, those you know, nefarious, dangerous websites like Human Rights Watch. But, but what, the, what, what Weibo allows is for the Chinese people to talk to themselves. It all happens within the Chinese firewall. And so the government is investing massively now in censors. But it's not as simple as just you know, kind of blocking out a URL. Um, they've got to start focusing on keywords. You know, don't let anybody say June 4th, or don't let anybody say you know, Tiananmen. 
Um, but, you know, Chinese people are smart. You know, it's not hard to figure out code words, different spellings, you know, hom synonyms, things of that sort that, that would um, allow you to say what you want to say without crossing one of these prohibited censored lines. And as a result, um, the Chinese people are openly expressing their discontent about various things, whether it's you know, government permitted air pollution. There's just an account today that you know, 1.2 million Chinese lost their lives prematurely due to air pollution in 2012. Um, the Chinese government's response to that is to try to censor it, but good luck. You know, um, you're seeing um, various forms of corruption highlighted, land theft. Um, there was a recent case of a woman who was forced to have a late-term abortion, which became a cause celebre, and, and the government had to intervene and, and dismiss the officials who were involved. Um, you know, a government that likes to dictate to its people is suddenly having to be responsive to its people. And I think that that is you know, inherent in social media, inherent in the ability of social media to break through and atomize society and to connect people in a way that they recognize their common discontent. And even a dictatorship depends to some degree on the consent of its people. And if they go from just sort of passive, unknowing indifference to knowing active discontent, that's when governments have to move. It doesn't turn them into an elected democracy, but it turns them into a government that has to be responsive, that has to be a little less unaccountable than it might have been. And so I think there's enormous potential here um, for, for the human rights cause. So let me, um, let me stop there, and I'd welcome your, your thoughts, questions, comments on this, or really you know, anything else on your mind. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as Jim said, my name's Atenas, and you talked a lot about the UN and HRW's work with the UN, but I was wondering if you could talk about the OAS and, for example, what happens when an up-and-coming country like Brazil gets an order to, for example, stop building a dam, um, and their reaction is instead to threaten to leave the system as opposed to follow that Order. So what is HRW doing to work with these kinds of up-and-coming difficulties? Yeah. Well, uh, no, good question. I mean, first of all, you know, the, the OAS, um, you know, apart from the European system, the Latin American human rights system is the most developed regional human rights system. And um, you know, both the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court have been institutions that we've worked intimately with for decades now. Um, now, the, the incident that you're alluding to was that um, the commission, um, in response to a complaint, started inquiring into a dam project that President Dilma Rousseff was very attached to. And disappointingly for Dilma, she responded by attacking the OAS system. I say disappointingly because she's been a human rights victim. We all you know, kind of have had hopes in her to bring Brazil more consistently into the pro-human rights category. I mean, if you, look, um, if you look in Latin America, there's been a real evolution in its attitude towards human rights. And countries like you know, Mexico, Costa Rica, Chile, Peru, um, Argentina, these days vote pro-human rights very consistently. Um, you have, you know, you still have the old style, Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua. But you know, the, the, the balance is shifting in a pro-human rights direction. Brazil has been a little bit in the center. You know, they, they tend to be uh, consistently pro-human rights or more consistently. Certainly, they're not like you know, Castro or the former Chavistas or whatever. But they're, um, they're a little more um, unsure about the effort. And for the movement from Lula to Dilma we hoped would be a positive one. My sense is that her reaction to the STAM ruling was a little idiosyncratic and not thought out. 
that you know, this dam mattered a lot to her, but I don't think she really re recognized the damage that she was doing to the broader institution by attacking it. And just, um, I guess it was last week, this effort by Venezuela, Cuba, et cetera, to undermine the free expression work of the Inter-American Commission failed. Um, and that was really a test case. If that had prevailed, it would have been a real blow to the Inter-American system. The fact that I think we, we had a positive result there, I'm hopeful, will lead to kind of a reassessment on the part of the Brazilian government and others who you know, may not have been happy when criticized by the Inter-American system, but overall understand its value. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Eric Xu, and I'm from China. I'm very glad you tell uh, things about uh, China. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, like nowadays, social media really getting powerful. Uh, for me, I, I I've got a Weibo, and I have hundreds of fans. Uh, yeah. Uh, so so um, I'm also a, a kind of human rights activist in China. Uh, we, uh, I'm a general secretary of a, a foundation called Towards Citizenship. Uh, we, uh, organize kind of a salon called the Citizenship, uh, uh, Reading. We invite uh, liberal minds to give speech, uh, quite publicly and openly about China's democratization. Uh, so my question is, uh, because of social media, do you think, uh, there is possible for, uh, Chinese government more accountable to ordinary people, or there will be kind of little revolution eventually? What's your opinion? Yeah. Well, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's going to be a struggle. And, and the Chinese government is, um, it is doing everything it can to make it difficult for people to use Weibo. You know, they're, they're you know, trying to require real name registration. They're, you know, they're, they're trying to sort of undermine the anonymity that makes it people, easier for people to criticize the government. Uh, although what's interesting is a lot, a lot of what's going on, people don't conceive of themselves as dissidents. You know, they, it's not as if everybody thinks, oh, I'm you know, Liu Xiaobo, the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner who's serving an 11-year prison sentence. People think, I'm just an ordinary citizen complaining about what the, you know, the thuggish local official down the road is doing to my community. And, and so there is a kind of an ordinariness to the complaints on Weibo that are, um, I think, encouraging and will, I predict, make it impossible for the Chinese government to win this battle between the users and, and, and the censors. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean that it's easy. I mean, I, I'm glad you have a Weibo account. I'll tell you a sort of a, an interesting story. I mean, I'm, I've, I've become a bit of a Twitter fanatic, and so I, you know, I, I tweet all the time. And um, a, a woman who works for Weibo came up to me at a conference I was attending and said, oh, that's great. Can I, can I um, just take your Twitter account and put it on Weibo? And I said, oh, yeah, no problem. You know, of course. You know, we'll translate it into Chinese. And of course, it still hasn't happened. And, it, you know, and it'll never happen. But, it, um, but it, 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 there is a, you know, a very large degree of freedom allowed on Weibo just because of the numbers involved. And you know, the Chinese government can just flood their censors in there. But the censors can never keep up when you're dealing with 400 million people. And even if it's just a tiny slice of them who are complaining, it's way more than the, the, the censors can, can control. So I'm optimistic. Thank you. I'm Charles Keaton. It's just a question about the human rights field from an organizational perspective. I'm just wondering whether you think, uh, in your experience, there's maybe too many human rights organizations, but not enough coordination between them. And that affects their overall impact they can have in the way that they operate. And I'm thinking particularly in the context of funding and the competition for scarce resources. Yeah, I mean, you know, my experience is not that there are too many at all. I mean, if you think about it, compare the human rights movement to, say, the environmental movement. You know, in the environmental movement, there are probably are a dozen big international organizations. You know, in the human rights field, there are two. The, you know, other than Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, there's no one else that has global coverage. So at that level, there's, if anything, too few. And we have totally different donor bases. We don't really compete at all. Um, the, if you look at sort of the local human rights movement in any particular country, um, there, you know, it depends on the country and really the degree of repression. But I don't 
get the sense that there are too many. I mean, we, we are always looking for kind of good local partners. There's very close coordination, um, almost mandatory coordination, between you know, the international groups and their local partners. You know, that's how we figure out what the major problems are. That's how we identify witnesses. That's how we strategize together. I mean, it's a very intimate partnership. And even between Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, there's very good coordination. I mean, we really, there's relatively little duplication. We have very you know, parallel, complementary efforts. So I, I mean, you can always say there should be more coordination. You know, maybe there should be more consolidation. But I don't get the sense that there is, um, that there's this kind of proliferation of groups beyond what the philanthropic market can bear. Um, so, anyway, maybe I'm being optimistic, but I don't see it as being a big problem. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the gentleman here, I mean, it's a little newer, several hours. Uh, you know, um, there seems to have been an, an, an effort in Latin America uh, led by Venezuela to create sort of parallel institutions to the, to the OAS and the institutions that had been historically U.S. dominated. I wonder if you could comment on that. I mean, you, you see this sort of thing periodically. You know, I mean, Venezuela certainly has tried to do that in Latin America. Um, you, you know, ASEAN is putting forward the possibility of a, you know, a, a human rights charter, Southeast Asian human rights charter, that wouldn't necessarily be connected to international standards. There's a similar effort in the Arab League, um, and the none of these have gotten that far. Obviously, the danger is if if they kind of develop standards that are broadly accepted, and those standards are filled with loopholes, it makes it easier for governments to violate rights, because they just point to these loopholes in their regional charter. But, you know, this may be um, you know, sacrilege to say in a, in a law institution like Stanford Law School, but I don't think the law matters nearly as much as what people's kind of public expectations are for what their rights should be and how government should behave. And so if, you know, even if, you know, which it hasn't, even if Venezuela were able to get a charter that says, you know, you can have free speech except insofar as you criticize the dictator, you know, it wouldn't get them any place because that's not what people think the right way to behave is. You know, they know they have a right to criticize the dictator. It's in, intrinsic to their being, you know. And so to, to fiddle with the law and to pretend that that changes public expectations isn't going to get you very far. Um, the law, it is a useful mechanism for codifying public expectations. Sometimes it can nudge expectations forward. It can maybe give a degree of precision that broad public expectations may not be able to acquire. But the, you know, the strength of our movement comes from our ability to contrast governmental conduct with the way people think government should behave. And most people aren't lawyers. Most people don't even know these treaties exist, let alone know what they say. So you know, it's, it's this contrast between those expectations in the conduct that is what really matters, and fiddling with new charters isn't going to change that. Yes, there are a couple of comments over here. Walsh is going on. So the real issue is not whether the questioning of law matters in the law school. What will it matter in the school? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I have a particular interest in relation to human rights, not via politics and governments and nations, more transnational behaviour linked to labour policy and employment law. Do you have any resources and any opinion on the evolution, particularly in the last decade of globalisation? It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll try to answer it. We have a, at Human Rights Watch, we have a program, we call our Business and Human Rights Program, which looks at the conduct of um, certain industries. We're, we're not comprehensive. But we, we try to pick certain transnational businesses that are particularly prone to problems. And we've done quite a bit of work on extraction industries, um, you know, looking at both their relationship to security forces that might be protecting their facilities, as well as the transparency of their payments to governments. You know, what happens to that money? Does it go into their Swiss bank accounts, or does it serve the people? Um, we've done a lot of work on you know, assembly plants, you know, labor-intensive manufacturing, um, and, and, you know, usually the right to organize in that context. Um, we've done a lot of work on migrant labor, you know, particularly domestic migrant laborers who tend to be excluded from labor laws. So if you're, you know, a poor Indonesian maid going to Saudi Arabia, you got very few rights. You know, your, your employer takes your passport, you're tied to that employer, you know, he can be sexually abusing you and you got no recourse but to go to the Saudi police who you're terrified of. You know, it's, it's, so we've done a lot of work on that. Um, most recently, we're doing a lot on um, 
on internet companies. And, you know, um, what are um, much more fun to play with a horse than to listen to this stuff. <laughs> you know, but um, what, are the, um, you know, what are your responsibilities operating in a place like China when the government says, censor those terms? Or, you know, give me the private email um, of, of one of your users. How do you respond? So, I mean, those are the sorts of things that we look at. We find that it's most productive looking at it from a um, kind of industry by industry basis because the issues are just so different from industry to industry. But we've been involved in, in actually drafting standards for all the things that I've mentioned. And then we monitor and, and try to enforce those standards. Sure. I had a quick question about, um, so you talked a lot about how individuals in a country, let's say China, for example, now that they're able to talk to each other, they can kind of see, oh, we're all thinking the same thing. I was wondering, um, and you said eventually the Chinese government would lose, I was wondering, how you think that change can be most peacefully attained and what you see Human Rights Watch's role is in that situation where you guys just work with governments and especially governments who are kind of abusing rights on the side but could be looking outward as human rights protectors. Um, how you see that change shifting and what you think your role is? Okay, well, I, let, me, let me try two things from your question. I think that's what you're driving at. I mean, one is um, with respect to sort of internal transformation. I mean, we don't see our role as a revolutionary organization. I mean, our role is to protect the freedoms of people to then organize and, and determine their own fate. So, you know, we're not sitting here and, you know, plotting to overthrow the Chinese government. We are trying to protect people who want to discuss what the Chinese government is doing and who are advocating for certain political reforms. And, and that's, you know, that is at least how we have defined the limit of human rights work. Uh, we're, we're not a solidarity organization. We're not a political organization. We are there to protect the rights so that others who are engaged in politi politics can act. Um, with respect to, um, you know, how do we go to a government, you know, say like, um, like India, where they are, on the one hand, you know, have serious problems with their Naxalite conflict or their activity in Kashmir or the Armed Forces Special Procedures Act or, you know, you name it. Um, we're dealing with them and their domestic rights uh, issues, but we're also um, asking them to help us on Sri Lanka or to help us on Nepal. Um, you know, does that work? Are we under pressure to kind of compromise one thing while we're doing the other? And um, we don't compromise is the bottom line. You know, and, and so we will, um, we will not sort of pull our punches on domestic rights abuses because we need, some, need a country's help on foreign policy, and we just kind of assume that governments can learn to walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, um, now, they don't like that necessarily, but they um, quickly get that we are you know, a professional principled organization. And once they understand the principles that we're operating under, they tend to learn to live with them and to recognize that we will criticize them more that we where we disagree, but we'll work constructively with them someplace else. And we're not doing this to be cheap or to score points. We're doing it because we're applying these principles across the board. And it's something that you know, certainly works with the Western governments where you know, we can criticize Obama about Guantanamo and work with him to you know, get something done in Afghanistan. And, you know, and, and it tends to work with you know, most governments. There are very few that you know, will we'll just sort of throw a fit because we criticize them domestically and so therefore we won't talk, about you, you know, talk with you about anything else. It tends not to work that way. And if it does, we just let them grow up and we don't change our conduct. You know. Uh, thank you so much, and this segues into kind of my next question regarding a country's impact on another country's. We've seen a lot with companies that they focus on reverse innovation or frugal innovation, creating a product somewhere else and then bringing it back to the U.S. If, for example, Mexico or another Latin American country is really successful with social media, how do you see that affecting the Mexican or Salvadorian population here in the U.S. when they see their country becoming more successful using it? Well, I'm not, I mean... Not quite sure I get the question. You know, so, for example, in Mexico, there's a high um, murder rate there. Right. Let's say that they're using social media and they get more awareness about it, and the murder rate goes down. Right. Can you see that affecting the populations in the U.S. where they start to take a stronger stance using social media, or do you think they'll go more typical channels of voting and getting elected that may not be accessible in other countries? Well, I mean, you know, it's hard to predict that it could go either way. I, you know, one, one point that I think is important to recognize is that um, – you know, the fact that there are electoral options available in the United States in no sense diminishes the importance 
of social media or NGOs or the press or organizing apart from that. Because I mean, if you think about it, you know, elections are incredibly blunt instruments. You know, once every two or four years, you're asked to cast your vote on array, the array of issues that matter to you. You've got to bring them down to one vote. You know, this person or that person, this party or that party. And you know, it's it's very unsatisfactory. It's essential, but it doesn't sum up democracy. And for me, you know, democracy requires opportunities for people to have a say on the range of issues that come up before governments every single day. And you know, how do you do that? Well, you vote that one day, but the other 364 days a year are really more likely in the next, the, the other you know, days and days in the next four years. You do it through the press, you do it through NGOs you belong to, and these days you do it through social media. So I think that these are all kind of essential supplements to elections, and they are required to make democracy you know, meaningful. Okay. So given the proliferation of information now available because of social media and the internet and so forth, is there a change in the strategy for human rights organizations because there are so many different issues pulling focus from people uh, in how you kind of raise awareness or raise, get to a critical level where movement actually happens? Yeah. Well, I think you know, one thing it's important to understand is that, um, you know, I mean, I, I opened up by saying, you know, to create a movement requires something that's big and slow moving. To some degree, that's still true, in the sense that it's really hard to build a movement. And you do need something that has a degree of durability to it, so that people can get outraged over a period of time. You know, I mean, Joseph Coney and the LRA were a problem for 20 years. And you know, finally, there was a kind of a, a tool that was used that made everybody aware of it. But even that required you know, a year or two of planning. And so it's the rare issue that you build a movement around. And you know, one, I think, um, you know, innovation maybe of the human rights movement is that we've learned how to enlist the press, and these days also social media, as a surrogate for a movement for the vast majority of the things that we do. And so um, you know, because you can get articles from one day to the next, you can move really quickly. You know, similarly with social media, we are able to sort of fine tune our interventions depending on kind of what's the latest development without building a social movement. And you sort of save the social movement for when you need it, you know, when there is a, a really big, lasting issue. But the bulk of what we do is quicker and more finite, and it's sufficient to use the press or, or other you know, popular surrogates rather than actually getting people in the street. Stairways, but thank you.